Okay, we good? Um, so some of you may have noticed that in the last five or ten years, zombies have become a big thing. There are lots of movies. There's a popular TV series. There's a zombie survival guide. And, of course, the zombie-themed Run for Your Lives 5K obstacle race that Heather and I took part in in June, which at the time I hadn't realized was important sermon research, but I guess you never know. <laughs> and it's not just zombies, which as individual monsters really aren't all that scary. Because even though they're gross, uh, they, on the other hand, they move really slowly. Um, but what makes the latest wave of zombies frightening is that they come part and parcel with the zombie apocalypse. I was in a store the other day. I was buying an old egg beater, and the woman selling it to me said with a joke that the only way that that ancient thing would break at this point would be because of the zombie ap- apocalypse. And we both knew what she meant. Some mysterious disease turns people into zombies, and the remaining still living people have to figure out how to survive without the trappings of society, such as gas stations, electricity, running water, and grocery stores. And they must do all this while either avoiding or killing hordes and hordes of slow-moving but persistent and sneaky, brain-dead former humans. So I have a couple of theories about the zombie craze and why it's so popular. Aside, of course, from being just another fun and creepy fashion, I think there are some underlying currents in the culture that the zombie apocalypse is tapping into, like underground streams connecting our collective unconscious. Very Carl Jung, right? All right, anyway. Um, One is that we're trying to figure out what it means to be human. Is it enough to have a body but no self-awareness except for your constant desire for brains? What does it mean to kill a zombie? Hi, Ann. Who used to be your stepfather. <laughs> I know, right? All right. Um, Ann's going to help me with the sermon now. But the other thing I think the zombie thing is about is our fears about a coming environmental collapse. I know. A.K.A. climate change. Okay, yeah. So something that really bothered me during the presidential yeah. campaign that we just came through. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. It's not time, Ann. Can you go with Mama, please? Uh, something that bothered me about the last campaign that we just came through is that climate change got almost no attention or discussion. It's probably just, you know, one of the biggest societal challenges of our generation and generations to come, and somehow it didn't manage to get a high-profile mention until Obama's acceptance speech, which I understand why politically that had to happen, but it's still worrying. Um, And it's even more worrying that it doesn't seem to take a very high priority in the national consciousness. But I worry about these things. What is the world going to look like when all the changes that climate change is bringing with it come into effect? What happens if we keep getting droughts like the one this summer that the Midwest suffered through? Because that's where corn comes from, and from corn comes just about all our other food. What happens if Superstorm Sandy is just a down payment where instead of going out to sea 99.9% of the time, all those Atlantic hurricanes start taking a left turn and slamming into New Jersey and New York and little old Maryland? What's the Inner Harbor going to look like if the Chesapeake Bay just rises by three feet? And in some ways, what's scary is that the conversation among the powers that be seems to be changing from, let's see if we should stop this thing, to how are we going to manage this when it really gets going. And yet, despite all my worries, I drove here today. I use oil oil heat and a gas stove, and I wrote the sermon on a computer in my warm house that was lit from above by electric light. We're all caught in this energy trap, and the zombies are scratching at the windows. So what does all this have to do with today's scripture? Well, as we come into Advent, we are waiting for Jesus to arrive as a baby in Bethlehem. And we're also waiting for Jesus to come again in a little something I like to call the Apocalypse Apocalypse. No, nobody thinks that's funny. All right, thank you, Kathy. Do you get it? Like, instead of a zombie apocalypse, it's an apocalypse apocalypse? Yeah, all right. Like the original? Okay. Mm. The The whole world, Jesus tells the disciples, is going to be in an uproar. 
You know, when it starts to get cold outside, you can have one of those nights where you can smell winter in the air. Well, Jesus can smell a huge conflict coming. And then when things seem at their worst, the Son of Man is going to arrive, and God's kingdom will be very close. So when I read the assigned lectionary reading the first time, my first thought was, oh, geez, not the apocalypse. I've been thinking about belief lately. What does a person really need to believe to be a Christian? And how important is belief anyway compared to things like trying to do the right thing or, paradoxically, trusting God instead of ourselves? And I really hope that believing in a literal Jesus... (laughs) I really hope that Uh, Believing in a literal Jesus coming out of the clouds as a guy with a big lightning bolt sword is not one of the requirements, because I just can't quite get there. It seems only slightly more likely than the zombie apocalypse to me. It's not just me who struggles with the second coming of Christ. There are plenty of passages in the Bible where early Christians were trying to figure out why Jesus hadn't literally come back already. Because it says right there, Quote, I'm not saying this for some future generation, but for this one too. These things will happen. Unquote. So here's the, that's the question I had. So here's the question actually that I had when I was rereading this. Why did Luke even put this passage in? After all, he was writing in maybe 100 or 130 AD. So they were already a generation or two away from Jesus. Why not, you know, just kind of leave that, you know, people alive will see the mon- son of man thing out. You know, just... Keep things neat, not mention it. Because the thing is, the reason for it is that in 70 AD, something happened that, for the Jews of Israel, really did bring an end to the world as they knew it. As Jesus predicted it, and Jesus predicted it, because the signs of it, just like leaves on the fig tree or the smell of winter in the air, were all around waiting to be read by a discerning eye. In 70 AD, after years of rebellion by the Judeans, the Roman Empire invaded Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and scattered all the people living there. Now we might think, oh, that's rough. You lost a really important building, kind of like if the Catholic Church lost St. Peter's Basilica or even the Vatican. But the second temple was not only a symbol of God saving the people from exile in Babylon, It was at the heart of what it meant to be a Jew and to worship God. The temple was where and how people worship God. It would be like telling a Baptist that they couldn't read the Bible anymore. Or for us, books about the Bible. All right. For me, maybe. Anyway, thank you, Kathy. I'm glad you're here. 70 AD was the end of the line for temple Judaism. Other things came up in its place. Christianity rabbinic Judaism that we know now, but essentially a way of life and a religion died at the hands of Rome that year. So what can we expect when the world comes to an end? In the zombie apocalypse, we have to learn violence, we have to trust our own creativity and survival skills, and basically, you're on your own. It's a test to see who's smart, tough, and lucky. In the apocalypse apocalypse, on the other hand, while there is testing, while we have to pray that we'll have the strength and the wits to make it through everything that's coming, at the same time, the apocalypse, the word apocalypse, is literally revelation. A revelation of God's power, of God's presence, of God's kingdom. We need to give our best, but ultimately this is about what God can do. We need to stay alert and do our part, but the larger drama is God's saving work in our lives as individuals and in the life of the world as a whole. So how do we prepare for the apocalypse? How do we prepare for God's kingdom? What does it mean to live into a different way of life? I think about the climate change example. No one person can do everything that needs to be done to bring the carbon in our air back to an environmentally sustainable level. But there are people who are trying things, some extreme and some mundane. Getting their house insulated, signing up for wind power instead of coal for electricity, or riding their bike everywhere. There are people who are taking radical adventures, living in the middle of nowhere, relying only on the land, or trying to have zero ecological impact in the middle of the city. And all these individuals, all these efforts, help. They, we, 
make a difference. But the problem is bigger than individuals, and it's not clear right now if our institutions are up to the task of facing this reality and getting the Titanic turned around. There's a lot to be worried about. And yet, even with the world coming to an end, maybe especially with the world coming to an end, God's kingdom is near. There is some comfort looking back at Jesus' words and realizing that we're not the first ones to face cataclysm. And the promise of Scripture is that, unlike in the zombie apocalypse, we don't face the danger and destruction alone. God goes with us. Help is on the way. It may be that help looks like the people leading so that the leaders can follow. It may mean that help help looks like powerful people from above finally getting it and throwing their weight around. It may mean that help is just a good cap-and-trade bill. But help might also mean all of us finding a different way to live and learning to care for one another as climate change unsettles everyone. It may mean that help is a vision of a new world, that vision rising out of the ashes of the old. I don't know what will happen as the climate changes and as we come to the end of life as we knew it. The smell of winter is in the air, but that doesn't mean you can predict how much snow will fall. Today's scripture is an encouragement to remember that just as God walked with the Jews when their way of life was destroyed with the temple in Jerusalem, so God will walk with us through the end of the world and on to whatever comes after that. Thanks be to God. Amen.